NASA crashes spacecraft into asteroid, passing planetary defense test. Annual American Muslim Day Parade held in New York. Anxious and determined, young protesters demand climate action. Israel closes Hebron's Ibrahimi Mosque. Hundreds of human remains belonging to Muslims found at excavation in Spain's Granada. Starvation looms over one million people displaced by Burma violence. From our Chicago studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samana Siddiqui. Our top story tonight, tens of Muslims and police officers marched in New York on Sunday to mark the 38th annual United American Muslim Day Parade. The march was held under the theme Health and Happiness for All after COVID-19. It drew Muslims from many nationalities that live in the U.S., Andalou Agency reports. Members of the NYPD and Muslim Officer Society also marched. They carried flags and chanted Allahu Akbar or God is the Greatest. The marchers also held a food festival and got a taste of cultural and musical performances for youth by Muslim Nasheed group Native Deen. On Friday, young activists coordinated a global climate strike to highlight the effects of global warming and demand more aid for poor countries hit by severe weather. More than a thousand young protesters marched to the streets of New York, signaling to leaders that they were sick of inaction on climate change. Meanwhile, leaders of developing nations hit by climate disasters pled their cases at the United Nations General Assembly. Protesters also took to the streets in Jakarta, Indonesia, Tokyo, Rome, Berlin and Montreal. 16-year-old Lucia Dick Pratt, who marched at the protest in New York, said she feels the adults aren't listening. Scientists have warned that countries aren't doing enough to meet the 2015 Paris Climate Accords target of limiting global warming to 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit this century. A splinter group of the QAnon movement known as Negative 48 is causing tensions at former President Donald Trump's rallies, the Washington Post reports. Negative 48's members were behind a mass pilgrimage to Dallas last year to see the supposed resurrection of John F. Kennedy Jr. They believe Trump will retake America from the forces of evil and are now following his rallies around the country like rock concerts. That has led to a silent standoff with Trump's security team, the Post said. It has raised concerns that they could disrupt events, alienate other fans, distract from Trump's message, or generate bad publicity. NASA engineers from its Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, will discuss what they learned from the mission. A NASA spacecraft intentionally hit the asteroid Dimorphos on Monday evening to change its course. This was the agency's first full-scale demonstration of such technology on behalf of planetary defense. It was also the first time humans have altered the dynamics of a solar system body in a measurable way, the European Space Agency said. There are currently no asteroids on a direct impact course with Earth. However, there are more than 27,000 near-Earth asteroids in all shapes and sizes. In a few years, the European Space Agency's HERA mission will follow up with an investigation of Dimorphos and the larger asteroid in the system, Didymos. More images of the impact will be streamed in the weeks and months ahead from a satellite provided by the Italian Space Agency. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Monday marked the ninth annual day dedicated to destroying weapons of mass destruction. On International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, Guterres rejected the idea that nuclear disarmament is some impossible utopian dream. He said eliminating these devices of death is not only possible, it is necessary. Guterres' warning comes amid heightened fears over a nuclear disaster or war stemming from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia has the world's largest nuclear stockpile. And Ukraine is backed by NATO nations, including the United States, which has the second largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. Jake Sullivan, President Joe Biden's national security advisor, said the administration has had high-level talks about Russian President Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats. Israel closes Hebron's Ibrahimi Mosque. Details after the break, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back after these messages. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. I am what hunger looks like in America. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. 
It's time for a people's vaccine. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. Let's just stand with those who stand with us. I'm talking about Nadine Mayansa. For two years in a row, Nadine Mayansa as chair led USERF to ask the US government to sanction India and declare it is a country of particular concern. It was USERF, by the way, whose recommendation was used to ban Modi for 10 years from entering the United States of America. Join hand in recognizing yourself and honoring Nadine Menza on October 2nd. Justice for All is a Muslim-led human rights organization with a 30 years track record. You have heard of name Burma Task Force. That's Justice for All. We started 30 years ago when Bosnian genocide was going on and working together, we stopped that. Join hand today and be there on October 2nd to stop genocide and protect Muslim minorities around the world. Scan this code on the screen to register or visit justiceforall.org forward slash VA. Assalamu alaikum. Stop this genocide, we need your help. Welcome back. The Israeli army has closed the Ibrahimi Mosque in the West Bank city of Hebron to Muslim worshippers. The move comes as Israelis celebrate the Jewish New Year on Monday. Mosque director Hassan al-Rejabi told Andalu agency the Israeli army prevented the call to prayer and made the mosque off limits to Muslim worshippers. He said Israeli settlers were allowed to celebrate inside the worship place. Hebron's Ibrahimi Mosque complex is believed to be the burial site of the prophets Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Israeli authorities divided the mosque complex between Muslim and Jewish worshippers after a Jewish settler murdered 29 Palestinians in the mosque in Ramadan 1994. On Wednesday, the diplomatic missions of Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan warned their citizens in Russia against participating in the war on Ukraine. The three Central Asian countries' embassies in Moscow released separate statements banning their citizens from getting involved in Russia's conflict. They also warned their citizens of the penalty of participation in the war. 
Taking part in armed conflicts in foreign territories is unlawful, the countries warned. Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are members of the Russia-led Collective Security Treaty Organization, while Uzbekistan withdrew from the military bloc in 2012. In related news, a 25-year-old reportedly opened fire at a Russian military recruitment office in Irkutsk after his best friend received draft papers. Abdullah bin Mohammed al-Sheikh, speaker of the Saudi Shura Council, called on Iran to not interfere in the affairs of other countries. His comments came during a meeting of the heads of the Shura Councils of the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC, in Oman. Al-Sheikh asked for Iran's regional cooperation as a neighbor with whose people the kingdom has religious and cultural ties. He called on Iran not to interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries, to cooperate with the International Atomic Energy Agency, and to fulfill its obligations. Saudi Arabia and Iran severed diplomatic relations in 2016 after an attack on the Saudi embassy in Tehran following Shia cleric Nimr al-Nim's execution by Saudi authorities. Muslim communities in Italy say they don't expect a negative attitude toward the more than 3 million Muslims living there by a new right-wing government to be formed after Sunday's general election. Muslim leaders said they look forward to working with the new cabinet on the religious freedom guaranteed by the Italian constitution. The far-right Brothers of Italy party, led by Giorgia Meloni, gained a solid majority in both houses of parliament. In mid-October, Meloni will be asked by President Sergio Mattarella to form a new government. She will be Italy's first woman prime minister, leading the first far-right government since the Second World War. Widespread fear and insecurity has forced more than one million people in Burma from their homes, a top UN official said Monday. Nada al-Nashif, UN Acting High Commissioner for Human Rights, warned of rising fears of starvation in the country. Among those displaced were 45,500 who migrated to neighboring countries. They are now living under precarious conditions without access to food, medical assistance and other basic services, al-Nashif said. She told the UN Human Rights Council the Burmese military is denying humanitarian access, including recent orders to halt operations in northern and central Rakhine state. Burma's military carried out a genocide in Rakhine against the Rohingya Muslim community in 2017. Thousands were killed and hundreds of thousands of Rohingya fled the country. The charred body of a young Palestinian man believed to be in his 20s was found in Qalqilya in the northern West Bank Monday. Police said there were bullet wounds and signs of severe torture on the corpse. The Institute of Forensic Medicine will perform an autopsy. Police spokesman Loe Irzigat told Arab 48 authorities are investigating the circumstances of the death. Police received a report of a shooting in a mountainous area east of Qalqilya. The incident came after at least 11 Palestinians were injured Friday when Israeli forces opened fire to disperse an anti-settlement rally in the city, Andalou Agency reports. Israel has built 164 settlements and 116 settlement outposts in the occupied West Bank and Jerusalem. Around 650,000 Israeli settlers live in the settlements, which are illegal under international law. A large number of human remains, presumably belonging to Muslims living in the Andalusian Islamic period, were found during an excavation in Granada, Spain on September 22nd. Dr. Amjad Suleiman, head of excavation, said five mass graves and about 600 human remains were found in a 1,000-square-meter area. He told Andalu Agency Granada was the last city in the Iberian Peninsula where thousands of Muslims fled from other cities during the Catholic King's era. Omar del Pozo, chairman of the Granada Grand Mosque Foundation, said many human remains belonging to Muslims have been found in excavations in different parts of Granada. Muslims ruled the region between the years 711 and 1492. This was followed by the Inquisition, where Muslims and Jews were expelled, killed or forcibly converted to Christianity. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back after these messages. over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear.
your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Assalamu alaikum! I love Adam's world because it makes me learn in a fun way. That Adam has green, a green face and um, orange hair. I like this song. I like Adam's world because it makes me... Because it makes me happy. What? No. No. Oh. And here's Adam and here's Anissa. Adam is and his sister. And Adam is a boy and he is very small. Download the new Adam's World app at adamsworldapp.com and let's help tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. This is Abdul Malik Mujahid. Muslims get bombarded with negative news, so good things which we do remain unknown. For example, do you know that Muslim Americans help stop the genocide in Bosnia? Recently, Muslim Americans defeated Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, and their lobbies to get a law passed through Congress about Uyghurs. Do you also know that it were Muslim Americans who work hard and smart to block Modi from entering the United States for 10 years? Yes, Alhamdulillah, all of that is your credit. Let's keep doing the good thing. Alhamdulillah, three achievers of our community are coming to Chicago to help strengthen justice for all Justice for All is a human rights organization run by Muslims, based in Chicago. We will honor Arsalan Suleiman, a young person raised in our communities who filed a lawsuit on Burma because of the Rohingya genocide. We will also honor Ambassador Rashad Hussain, raised in our communities, married in Chicago, and who is now the ambassador at large for international religious freedom. In addition, we will honor the latest commissioner of USERF, Imam Muhammad Majid, for his relentless support for Burma Task Force. Please join me. Let's come together on October 9th in Chicago. Scan this code to register or visit justiceforall.org forward slash Chicago. Assalamu alaikum. To stop this genocide, we need your help. Welcome back. According to researchers at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, children who are infected with COVID-19 show a substantially higher risk of developing type 1 diabetes. The lead author of the study is going to join Edward Ahmed Mitchell for a detailed conversation. Over to you, Edward. Thank you, Samana. And now we move to a discussion of some very disturbing news about the state of our youth, their health, and what COVID-19 might be doing to cause an increase in diabetes among young people. Very disturbing news. To discuss this, to learn more, we're very happy to welcome our guest, Dr. Pamela Davis. Dr. Davis is the Arline H. and Curtis F. Gavin Research Professor at the School of Medicine, and she is a professor at the Center for Community Health Integration School of Medicine as well. Uh, many of you may know her already. She's a renowned physician and medical researcher, uh, and she became the Dean of the School of Medicine and Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs at Case Western Reserve University. I could go on, but that's a bit of a taste of Dr. Davis's expertise and background. Dr. Davis, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Thank you for having me. A pleasure, a pleasure. So first, um, you know, we're, we're here to discuss, you know, this apparent rise in diabetes that has some connection to COVID-19. Can you start by just telling us what, what's the normal impact, quote unquote, that diabetes uh, has on young people in America? Like pre-COVID-19, what kind of rate were we seeing of diabetes among youth? 
Well, I think di uh, type one diabetes or, uh, or juvenile diabetes uh, is, occurs in maybe one in 10,000 uh, uh, children. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a serious disease. It is a lifelong disease. And it has to do with the failure of the pancreas to make the hormone insulin. And what insulin does is it helps you handle sugar in your body. If you don't make enough insulin, you have too much sugar in your blood. This can come out through your urine and dehydrate you. And this causes metabolic disturbances, which if left unchecked can kill you. So it is a very serious disease. Uh, it is caused, it is thought, by an autoimmune phenomenon. That is, antibodies in your body attack the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. So destroying them and destroying their ability to, to make insulin. So this is a disease that is caused by an immune phenomenon in the body itself. That's what made us look at COVID uh, at the aftermath of COVID with respect to diabetes, because there are many reports in the literature now that COVID incites antibodies that cross react with, with our own bodies. And we were concerned that if that was one of the impacts of COVID, that in fact, the rate of new diagnoses of type one diabetes might go up. And that's what we found. So, Dr. Davis, can you tell us more about why that that is, how exactly COVID-19 uh, led to this rise in diabetes? And is it accurate that it's a 72 percent rise in reported diabetes cases among young people? Can you tell us more about those numbers and why exactly this happened? Yes, there's a certain number of children who get diabetes every month, every year. Um, we found that 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 rate went up by uh, about 72% in those zero to 18 years of age. We divided the group into those zero to nine and 10 to 18. And one of the reasons that we did that is although we have great confidence in the physicians who are putting these diagnoses into the medical records, sometimes it's hard to tell type one diabetes from type two diabetes, type two diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, but now we've recognized that some of it comes on in the teenage years, but it's rare below the age of 12. So in the group of zero to nine, the increase in the diabetes in zero to nine is almost surely type one, is almost surely that autoimmune type of, uh, of diabetes. But there's also an increase in the, t in the 10 to 18 year olds. And our group is following up by trying to look at type two diabetes, both in children and in, the, in adults. Understood. Now, next question, you know, the, is this a permanent condition once people are getting it through COVID, just like with type one normally, is it that it's a permanent condition or is it something that's, that's a short-term phenomenon? We believe it is permanent. So I guess that begs the question, is there anything that can be done to protect people who have not yet gotten COVID from having this outcome? Or is it just not to say a crapshoot, but is, is there anything that, that can be done short of just don't get COVID? Well, it's difficult not to get COVID these days, but I would certainly advise doing everything possible. Uh, only a few children have been uh, immunized against COVID. Uh, and I would would urge that. And now that there's a, the op opportunity to immunize children and there's an opportunity to immunize against the uh, the Omicron variant that's uh, prevalent right now, I would do that. Um, I would also advise the masks. I would advise distancing from people that you know are sick. Uh, and I would advise masking and making sure that you don't go close to people who are sick. And that's especially true for families in which uh, there is a family history of, uh, of type 1 diabetes. Um, I think that parents should be on the alert for the six month, at least the six month period after COVID uh, strikes their child for 
uh, frequent um, uh, child becoming frequently thirsty, the child going to the bathroom a great uh, deal, urinating a great deal, and the child starting to get uh, hungry a lot. Those are the classic symptoms of diabetes. And if the child starts to be lethargic or smell fruity, it's an emergency. Get them to the uh, get them to the emergency room. But uh, this is a rare thing. I do want to emphasize that we're talking about two in a, in ten thousand. But if it's your child, it's a hundred percent. Absolutely. Now let me ask you this once and again. Yeah, I know you've done the research phase, but if someone contracts COVID, right, and they begin to show like mild symptoms of this beginning, is there any way to intercede at that point? Or is it just a matter of trying to catch it so you can prepare for what's coming and make sure they know how to handle and treat diabetes? Well, I believe it's mostly uh, uh, prepare for uh, prepare for what's coming. There's a great deal of research work going on in terms of intervention and delaying uh, the onset of, uh, of type one uh, diabetes. So I think it would be prudent to go to the, to the doctor and to particularly to a pediatric endocrinologist as quickly as possible to see what, uh, at what stage you are and uh, what might be able to be done. Doctor, since I have you, I, I have to ask you, so for, for diabetes in general with young people, are we also seeing a rise in cases of diabetes uh, type 2 uh, just because of the diet of kids? Is there anything that parents, my parents might think, all right, my kids are vaccinated, I'm not worried about that, but do they need to be thinking about, you know, protecting their kids from that other form of diabetes? Anything that you want to advise there since we've got you here? Oh, gee, I think it's very important to uh, control the, uh, the body weight, particularly in the adolescence. Um, you know, sometimes when children, uh, you get out from uh, mom's cooking uh, and start uh, buying uh, snacks on their own and drinking soda pop, um, it's difficult to control what the child eats, but a big effort needs to be made to control the body weight it is probably the leading cause of type two diabetes in children. And if you can keep your child at a, at a normal body weight, the, the parents who can keep their children from drinking soda, you know, sugared sodas are way ahead of the game. And if you can keep them from the, uh, the salty, but high calorie, high calorie, empty calorie snacks, that's a good thing. You see many children from the high schools and the, you know, even the middle schools stopping at the nearby store and buying soda and snacks after school. You can avoid that. That's very important. And if you bring the children up to enjoy healthy snacks and, uh, hell and water to like water, uh, that is, uh, that's a very good thing to do. And also to make sure that they continue to exercise. We all take a deep breath when we see that um, uh, so many schools to save money have reduced their athletic programs and their gym classes and their physical exercise during the day. Maybe there are things that parents can do to encourage that uh, physical activity to help control the weight. Understood. Thank you for asking that because it's really very important and it's a scourge these days. We do not want to see this get worse. Absolutely. As you said, it's it's a lifelong illness. There is no cure um, for it, for the for the type one, I understand. So once you have it, that's a scary thing. Well, last question. Now that I think about it, is there potential for one day there to be some sort of way to treat or cure either one of these forms of diabetes? I know there's not now, but is there any hope in the pipeline, anything in terms of cutting edge research that might indicate hope in the future? I do think there's cutting edge research. Uh, there are studies growing pancreatic isle islets in culture. So those cells that make insulin, they grow them in culture. And there are a lot of studies to figure out how to transplant them into the body so that it can make insulin and it can make insulin in, uh, in response to the appropriate signals, you know, so that when your blood sugar goes up, you put out a little bit more insulin. You would like that to, uh, that control to be there. That would be a wonderful thing. I think there are ways of manipulating, there are going to be ways of manipulating the immune system 
even once the process has started. Right now, I think if you can anticipate it and take children who are at risk, you may be able to limit the, um, uh, to delay the time that type one diabetes takes hold. But I think you, there are ways coming down the pike to uh, even once you see the signs to prevent it or to abort the, uh, uh, the uh, destruction, if at all possible, uh, yeah, if, if that would be possible, that would be wonderful. The research is going great guns, and uh, I certainly hope that we'll be able to do that because it is uh, it is something that lasts all your life, and it has many downstream consequences, heart disease, kidney disease, um, small blood vessel disease in terms of your, uh, your be ability to walk, ulcers on your feet, so many things that you don't want to have happen if you can avoid it. Absolutely. Well, we hope that that, that research will bear fruit, uh, God willing. But in the meantime, it's still not uh, something you just want to re rest on and hope. You want to try to avoid this problem if you can, whether it's from Certainly COVID do. or from what you're eating. So, Dr. Davis, I want to thank you so much for sharing this information with us, with our viewers. We hope it's a benefit to everyone. And we look forward to having you back on, hopefully to discuss more positive uh, news about uh, the struggle to keep people healthy and a treat. We would, we would certainly love to love to be able to do that. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. I hope I wish your readers, your your viewers, excellent health. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Davis. And we'll send it back to you, Samana. Thank you. That's all from our Chicago studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Salam and good night.